that the Lord has made. We do rejoice and we're glad in it. We're grateful for it. Hey, we're five minutes out. I want you to go in and start sharing this time together. Come on, I'm giving you a few moments to come on and share, 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 share. Come on and share with us. Share with your brothers and sisters. Share with your friends and coworkers. Amen. This is Wednesday, the 17th of June. Can you believe it? We're in the sixth month of the year. In the second quarter of the year. Lord have mercy. I realize, God bless you in the morning. Hallelujah. I realize that some of us are like, where has the year gone? Hey, God, this has been some years so far, hasn't it? But while you're sharing, uh, and I'm sitting on my steps because that's where I need to be. My steps are proud. And I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say and see the shirt strong to the finish. Ah, hallelujah. We are strong to the finish. And we're walking in the power of God. And I'm just excited about Jesus, aren't you? So for the next few moments, I want you to share. I want you to join me. I want you to let somebody know that Light Builders Church, Midday Matter with Bishop J. Charles Carrington Jr. is on the air. Light Builders Church, Midday Matter with Bishop J. Charles Carrington Jr. is on the air. All right? So I want you to join me. We get ready to get into a powerful word. So I want you to share with me. <clears throat> Amen. Things getting better up here. Sinus, pollen. I just call myself delivered and I keep it moving. <laughs> oh, God is so faithful in me. Come on, share. We're on Simulcast Facebook Live. We're blessed to be on right now over Periscope, over uh, Facebook Live, or Nevo. Amen. Which is broadcasting all of our outlets. And I want you to share. For the next 30 minutes, there's going to be a word that's going to bless your life. Beloved, look, while we're waiting, I want to recommend this book. Some have gotten it already. Some have already said, Bishop, this book is powerful. You see this transformation theology. Now, with everything we're doing, everything we're dealing with, this book I wrote back in 2016. Didn't realize how prophetic it would be. God told me to write it. I said, Lord, am I ready? Is the world ready? Are we ready for this? And the Lord said, write it. I wrote this book in a little over eight days. Eight days took me to write this book. And uh, it's powerful. I declare God is speaking. Because this is the remedy. Other solutions have been forwarded. We've had uh, all kinds of theology, reform theology. Nothing wrong with it. It's just we've had these things. We've had liberation theology. And, and, and while we are looking at our situations today, I must say that some of our solutions haven't worked. It's time, I believe, for transformation theology. Not saying that because I wrote it. I'm saying it because as a man of God, I believe I heard from God. And this is the remedy for where we're going. Transformation theology. Go on Amazon, get this book, bless the Lord, read it, and it will bless you. I have a workbook coming out soon. So as we go around the different places, as the Lord lifts this pandemic, and we will teach from this book, from the workbook, it's going to be a tremendous blessing. All right? So again, I'm sitting on my steps because we're moving on up. And I want everybody to move up with me. So let's pray. It is 12 o'clock. Matter of fact, it's 12 o'clock. Father, thank you for what you're about to say. Thank you for what our eyes have seen, for what our ears have heard, for what our hearts feel. Lord God, get the glory out of this time together. And in everything that is said and done, you arise and every enemy be scattered. In Jesus' name, we thank you that all of you will be seen in earth and not me. And we promise not to touch your glory, nor to hinder your brains, but let the anointing that destroys yours and remove burdens be represented today. In Jesus' name, amen. You have your Bible? 
for the next few moments, hold up with me and say, Lord, I thank you that I have a Bible. It is my personal copy a basic instruction before leaving earth. I am a believer, not a doubter. I'm not just a hearer, but I'm also a doer. And my life is so much better because of the word of the living God. Therefore, I declare my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will not be distracted, but I will hear what the Lord has to say. And as a result, of what I hear today. Somebody declare with me, I'm going to leave this experience better than I came in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, before we go to our scripture, I, I, I want to remind us that we are not just in the middle of a pandemic. Things are being shaken. The Bible says, if anything can be shaken, it will be shaken. We are transitioning from the church age, church as usual, to the kingdom age. We are transitioning from the way we used to do things to the way we should be doing things. Kingdom first. I don't want to offend you, but I have been called to speak on behalf of God. So if that offends you, I'm sorry in the beginning, and I don't want to say it again, but I've been called to represent God as a preacher of righteousness. And the majority of my life, I've been walking with God. Too late to turn back now. <laughs> so I want to declare this to you, that beloved, God wants us to see kingdom greater than culture. Kingdom greater than color. Kingdom greater than tradition. Kingdom trumps culture. Kingdom trumps tradition. Kingdom trumps color. And the reason why things are being shaken, because too long we've seen things from the wrong perspective. So for a few moments, I want to talk from the topic, the correct approach. The correct approach. Look with me at our theme scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, for substance, for backup, for the word of life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Today I'm going to read it from the New King James. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Somebody tweet text or type. That's the least I can do. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Somebody help me say, that's all I have to prove. That good, that perfect, and that acceptable will of God. Again, look at verse 2 of Romans 12. Come on, and be not conformed to this world. This is the foundational scripture of transformation theology. Come on, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, that perfect and acceptable, or that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. With this sex in mind, I want to continue laying the groundwork for our study that we're going to have in this book. Yes, our midday manner for some time to come is going to be studying together transformation theology. All right? So, number one, understand that it is the move of God that it will take to totally change things for the better. I want to say a bold statement. And again, I don't apologize. God used Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to bring attention to the nation of his thoughts of racism, segregation. We took a spiritual move and made it secular. We took a work of the Holy Spirit that God had brought to his prophet 
to hit us all right between the eyes in order to change minds and change hearts. So we must understand that it is the move of God that would change things for the better. Dr. King was assassinated and there were some strides. But can we all admit that everything has not been completed? Everything has not changed for the better. Why? Because when we take a spiritual thing and make it a flesh thing, it won't complete the job. When we take a spiritual work and try to do it from fleshly means, it will not fulfill what it was sent to you to do. Dr. King said, I am a drum major for justice. And he was. He was a prophet to our nation to repent of the ills of racism, slavery, segregation. God sent this man to declare truth. Many took the message as offensive. Many took the message as a time calling for revenge. Many are taking it now to call for reparations, to call for somebody to be pulled down so we can be pulled up. And that's not kingdom. So let's continue and understand the move of God. Is that what it is? That will totally change things for the better. Don't leave me now. Stay with me and pray with me. Number two, what is manifesting in society is as a result of what is going on in the realm of the spirit. God has called me to proclaim truth. I am a prophet of God. I don't go yeah, yeah, yeah every time I talk. But I am a man of God and this year is the year of the mouth, the year of the declaration and the year of justice. God is tired of injustice, not just flesh injustice, but God is tired of injustice that is hindering the work of the ministry from going forward. So he's allowing the warfare in the realm of the spirit and it is also being manifested in the realm of the flesh. God wants to bring it in to injustice. God wants to bring it in to racism, segregation, all that mess in his church. How can the church bring change until the church is changed? We still got black church, white church, Latino church, Asian church. God is raising up kingdom. And that's why things are being shaken. God have mercy. So we must understand that the move of God is what it will take to change things totally. We must understand that what's being manifested in society is as a result of the warfare going on in the heavenly realm. And number three, transformation is a work of the Holy Spirit. We can march, we can scream, we can yell. But until the Holy Spirit does his work, we're wasting our time, okay? Number four, in regards to the efforts of the past, as well as today's efforts, if what we used to do has not yet worked, can I ask you a question? Why do we keep doing it? But I have to march. I've got to make my voice heard. I understand and I agree. But two questions arise to those that want to make your voice heard. What are you saying and who do you want to hear? What are you saying and who are you talking to? Kingdom says it's time for us to raise our voices like a trumpet and cry out to God. Cry out to God for change that only he can bring. Cry out to God for hearts being transformed. Cry out to God for the church to be kingdom instead of culture, tradition, and old ways that have not worked. Oh my God. Number five, the root of persistent and unremedied issues is in the heart and the minds of men. When there is no manifested change, it's because the hearts of men and the minds of men have not changed. God is calling for change. God is calling for the manifestation of change. He is ready to end racism in his church. He is ready to do 
what he said he would do. To let righteousness run down like a mighty river and like a stream. To cause the kingdom efforts and the kingdom message to be heard worldwide and understood. That's what God is about to do. That's what he's calling us to do. That's what he's anointing us to do. All this signal will remain strong, I declare it. So beloved, we must understand and take God at his word and understand the times that we're in. Understand the work we've been called to do and get about that work. Are y'all with me? Come on, stay with me now. We got to get about the work. Understand the times that we are in and get about our kingdom assignment. The root issue in man's heart and man's mind remains unremitted because we're seeking to deal with root issues from a standpoint of sociology and not theology. Pastor Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans made that great statement and I mirror it. We're trying to deal with stuff from a sociological standpoint instead of a theological standpoint. Only the word can change lives, okay? Only the word can change lives. Now, give me a few more moments. I wanna hit this thing, we're gonna let you go, all right? What are some of the key indicators that we are in need of mind change and heart change? What are some of the key indicators that we are desperately in need of mind change and heart change or mind transformation and heart transformation? Here's a few. Reliance upon the flesh more than the spirit. We know we need transformation when we rely on the flesh more than we rely on the spirit. I'm not condemning protesting. I'm not condemning uh, picketing. I'm not condemning withholding monies from businesses that support racism, segregation. No, I'm not. I'm not condemning spending your money elsewhere where it's appreciated and wanted. But we must ask the question because we all know that these things have been tried before. Can the flesh solve anything? What has been changed? Well, Bishop, we got to keep beating on people until they change. And if they don't change, then we're going to have to do something more drastic. Again, are we talking theology? Are we talking sociology? Are we talking kingdom? Or are we talking flesh? Mm. Here's another indicator that our minds and hearts need to be changed. Are we walking in fear? more than we're walking in and by faith. Are we walking in fear more than we're walking in and by faith? Oh my God. Those who should know better, I've been listening, and this is not a condemnation, no throwing shade, but I've been hearing people talk about, well, I got stopped by the police and I was afraid. I hear people talking about, well, I walked across a parking lot and, and, and folk of a different race looked at me funny. Well, I went in the store and they begin to take and move stuff around and all this. I've been hearing all this stuff from supposedly strong and kingdom people. What in the world? We are folk that preach. No weapon formed against me prosperous. We are kingdom people that declare the just shall live by faith. And we're out here talking about fear. Then we have people getting on sounding good sociologically, saying that we ought to tell the gangbangers and the drug dealers to look out for our neighborhoods. Are we kidding? Having gangbangers and drug dealers arm up to protect our neighborhoods? They haven't protected them from getting folk high. What makes us think they're going to protect it from folk coming in to do us harm? They're selling drugs to our children. Selling drugs to people that are bound by addiction just for the dollar. Have them protect the neighborhood? 
Really? Is that kingdom or is that sociality? Oh my God, can I go on? How we know we're in need of transformation? Because we're walking in unforgiveness and unforgiveness. I'm going to say this because it's public knowledge. Pastor Rod Parsley said something that offended many. And I believe that he maybe was attempting to say this thing a certain way, but it fell short. So he got on and apologized, and I'm seeing many of us kingdom people say you're not forgiven. That's not an apology. What are we doing? Let God judge that. I mean, wait. oh my God, there you go, Bishop. You you are Uncle Tom. You, you are Oreo cookie. You are a lackey. Oh my God, please, 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 please. I'm kingdom. Kingdom first. Kingdom above all things. I know that some of our other brothers and sisters have been complicit, have been silent, have said nothing, have done nothing, and I'm praying that God touch their hearts and convict them by the power of the Holy Ghost to speak what he has spoken to them to say. But if someone acknowledges a fault and asks for forgiveness and we come out of our mouths and say we don't forgive, are we kingdom? Oh my God. Come on. How long do we need our minds changed? Because I'm wondering how many of us have ever done something we're ashamed of or want forgiveness for and sought to be forgiven? How would you feel if someone did not pardon you? How would you feel if someone did not forgive you? Oh, but they keep doing it. They keep doing it. Then we take other measures. But I'm wondering. Are we recognizing the need for mind and heart change? Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have we all forgotten the principle that the word spoke? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What sort of a man sows, that shall he reap. If we reap unforgiveness, it's because somewhere along the line, we've sown unforgiveness. If we sow bitterness, somewhere along the line, we're going to reap bitterness. Huh. Here's where I close. Come on. Look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7 and 8. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7 and 8, David was confronted with a conundrum. <laughs> How you like that word? David was confronted with a horrible situation. Now you got to know the whole context. So David had run from his life or from Saul for his life for over a decade, almost 20 years. From the time that he was anointed by Samuel to the time he took the throne, about 20 years had transpired. And David was forced to run from Saul, run for his life. Mm. So David found himself hanging out with the Philistines. And there were some among the Philistines that did not trust David. So they gave him and his mighty men a section of a place called Ziklag. Ziklag. Some of y'all know where I'm going. Stay with me. David and his men lived in Ziklag. <coughs> they took their children their livestock, cattle, all their possessions, and moved into Ziklag. He had over 400 men, as a matter of fact, probably 600 around that time, that ran with him, that met with him while he was in Lodabar, and began to walk with him in his time of transition, while he was running from Saul. So stick with me now. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, we see that while David and his men were running with the enemy, forced into fleeing for their lives, that they, while they were gone, the Amalekites came and stole their wives and children, stole their livestock, and then burned Ziklag with fire. The Bible says that the men began to lift their voices and cry out unto God and wept bitterly crying 
And even in the midst of crying, some of them threatened to stone David. Come on, don't cut me off. Some of them threatened to get rid of David. And David, being a man of war himself, could have drew his sword and said, I wish a Hebrew would. <laughs> David could have said that. I wish a Hebrew would come at me like that. But no, the Bible said that while the men were crying and the men were seeking and trying to debilitate, uh, actually deliberate what they were doing and going to do with their lives and what had happened, David called for the priests and David called for the ephod. And this is what David did. Look at verse 7 and 8. We read the response of God's man in the midst of a threatening situation. David said to Abiathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar, Amalek's son, oh God, brought the ephod to David. And David, hear the words, inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. David asked God, what should I do? God hammers. And he asked him, shall I pursue after this troop of Amalekites? Or shall I not only pursue, shall I overtake them? Because I just don't want to go and fight. I want to take what's mine. I just don't want to go and, and have a wrestling match. I want to come back with what I lost. God have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. So beloved, the Bible says that God answered him and said, Pursue, go get your stuff, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. What I'm trying to say is God is raising up a kingdom people with a kingdom mindset that inquire of the Lord. Before we do anything in the flesh, we ask God, what is your move? What is your joy? What is your pleasure? What is it that you want me to do? Shall I go forth? Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? And shall I recover all? Oh, the whinings, Bishop Marvin Winings, Marvin Carvin, Michael and Ronald, you should sing a song that's so still dear to my heart. Are we really doing your will? We've come over a lot of mountains and all we seen for miles are hills. I admit we get discouraged, but that's just the way we feel. Are we doing your will? It's time for a generation of kingdom folk to rise up and inquire of God. This racist stuff, this segregation stuff, this culture stuff, this college stuff, this uh, all this stuff has been going on too long. God is saying, who will ask me? What is my solution? Who will inquire of me? What will you have me do? Oh God, I, I feel this. Because God is raising up a kingdom people. A people that he has called to be Caleb-like. To subdue mountains and declare, give me back my mountain. You don't own it. It ain't your right to stay in it. Give it to me. He's calling for people that are kingdom-minded to take territories and to go out and pursue and recover all. He's calling for people to declare that I've heard God and he's called me to sit in authority in the mountain of government. Sit in authority in the mountain of arts and entertainment. Sit in authority in the mountain of family. Sit in authority in the mountain of religion. I'm not talking about religion like we call it, but true religion, pure and undefiled, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, helping the widow and the fatherless. Oh God, which the church is being forced to do like never before. Oh God, he's calling for us to sit at the mountain, yes, of social service and help people and give them the gospel. He's calling us to sit at the mountain and rule in business, industry, and commerce. He's calling us to sit and rule in the mountain of education. Oh, can I get a witness here? He's calling us to sit and rule in the mountain of media. To 
Too long have we abdicated these mountains. Too long have we walked away and said it's somebody else's job to do these things. But God is saying, who will like David say, Father, God, show me. Help me to inquire of you. Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? And shall I recover all? Man, I feel myself preaching. I better calm down. Because, beloved, we marched. We yelled. We screamed. We picketed. We said black lives matter. We said all lives matter. We're mad at them for saying all lives matter. We're mad at them for saying black lives matter. I want to adopt another statement. Kingdom matters. Kingdom matters. Oh, my, my God, my God. Kingdom matters. When will we be kingdom? Kingdom. All this other stuff. God is saying, when will somebody inquire of me? When will somebody hear my word and do my action? When will somebody approach this thing from the realm of the spirit? You see, it's going to take the spirit to unite the races. It's going to take the spirit to unite the church. Aren't you tired of doing something the same way and get no results? We get press. Yeah, that's great. We get folks saying they out there doing something. But what are we doing if it's not kingdom? It's time for kingdom. Well, we're ready for God to get the glory. And we want to inquire of him. Because he has solutions. Can I get somebody to declare? Kingdom matters. Kingdom matters. Culture, not above kingdom. Tradition, not above kingdom. Race, not above kingdom. Classism, not above kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thou will be done. Well, I gotta go, beloved. The call is gone forth. Who will answer? Who will, as we started talking in the beginning of this time together, correct our approach? Who will correct our approach? Who will correct our approach? Beloved, I love you. We must see God transform hearts and minds. Transform hearts and minds. I declare it's time for transformation theology. Bishop, you just peddling your book. No, not really. I'm peddling king. I'm peddling king. And it's time that we take up king. Father, under apostolic authority, I decree and declare that your sheep hear your voice and a stranger we will not follow. Give us boldness, give us clarity, give us wisdom, and God, you arise and every enemy be scattered. In Jesus' name. Father, show us. Shall we pursue? Shall we overtake? Shall we recover all? There's some things that we need. The enemy got it now. But I hear God saying, rise up, pursue, and recover all. My time is up. Thank you for this half an hour midday manner. Be blessed today. God bless you in a powerful way. God bless. Love you. Thank you all for tuning in. Hey, I want the best for you. Let's go get it. You see me? Let's go get it. Let's go get it.